I guess I'm recording my whole screen. I don't know if that's dangerous, but anyway, hopefully nothing comes up. So here we go. Lots of details. So I may or may not have time to actually do an example tonight, but I will definitely do examples for the rest because I have two more nights this week again. But I need to talk about all these things because you need to know what they all are. And um, I'll try to show you how to find them separately. Once I go through all this stuff, I'll show you how to find them separately. And then I think with each example, regardless of whether the question asks for it or not, I'm going to find every single piece that is possible um, for a hypothesis test. So first, in statistics, a hypothesis is a claim about a population parameter, right? So you guys are limited to mean or proportion, just like you were with confidence intervals. So you guys did confidence intervals for population means, or you did confidence intervals for population proportions, right? Those were your two main situations. Obviously, with means, you had to decide with sigma being known or unknown. Same idea here. Now, instead of finding an interval approximating the population parameter, you are making a claim about it and testing that claim. So your hypothesis is the claim that's made, and I'll show you what I mean, whereas the hypothesis test is the method that you're using to actually test that hypothesis. Um, and here, you know, this is an example. I'm going to use some of this stuff. This is an example. I'm not going to go into detail, but <clears throat> this is an example of a claim made. Um, Let's say the average McDonald's restaurant generates $2.2 million in sales each year with a standard deviation of 0.2. Rebecca wants to know if the average sales generated by McDonald's restaurants in Tennessee is greater than the worldwide average. So she's going to run a test determining if the average for her whatever area is greater than this other value um, from the worldwide. So that's that's what it sounds like when they run a test. They they either claim something or they want to you know run a test to determine something about the population that's defined, right? So um, when you guys are doing a hypothesis test, the moment that you realize that a claim is being uh, you know stated or whatever, there are two things that you have to consider. We call it a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. And every time you run a hypothesis test automatically you need to write down your null and your alternative. That is the first part of every hypothesis test. So your null hypothesis notation is represented with what we call H naught. So H with this little subscript zero. And this is the claim that the parameter is equal to some value. So you always the equal sign, whether it's exactly equal, less than or equal, greater than or equal, anything with the equal is always on the null. Um, your alternative, which is represented three different ways. You may see it as HA, H1, or H capital A. Claim that the parameter differs in some way from a value. So the um, notation, the symbols that you see, greater than, less than, or not equal to. So stopping there for a second, um, just showing this example that I have up, we wanted to determine if the average sales generated by McDonald's restaurants is greater then the worldwide, you notice that I started with my null hypothesis and my alternative hypothesis. And I'm running a test about an average for a population. So we did mean here. And so, and typically you see equal to on the null hypothesis. Sometimes you see less than or equal to, sometimes you see greater than or equal to. But being that the claim was that the average was greater than 2.2 million, my alternative includes all the notation or operations that are not equal to. So the greater than symbol doesn't have an equal sign involved. So it goes on my alternative. So this is what it would look like for an alternative hypothesis under a claim like this. And the null hypothesis would be equal to or sometimes less than or equal to. So anytime, again, you hear a claim, and we'll do enough examples too, but anytime you hear a claim, you want to consider your null and your alternative hypothesis. Um, I'm going to look at... Wait, I should have another one just for reference, just to show. Here's another one, okay? Um, just to show how we find these. Nationally, patients who go to the emergency room wait an average of seven hours to be admitted into the hospital. So this is like, you know, um, a value that's represented nationally. Do patients at rural, rural, I can't say that, rural hospitals have a different waiting time? So they're testing a claim or testing something regarding whether 
the average waiting time at these other hospitals are the same or different from the average for the national, which is seven hours. So it's either equal to or not equal to. I don't hear anything re related to like greater than or less than like the last one. So this is my null hypothesis. This is my alternative hypothesis. Notice that the alternative is not equal to because the alternative always carries those signs, right? Either less than, greater than, or not equal to. And the null is always the equal to one. And we're running a claim about a mean, so we use this notation mu. Um, I'm just talking about the null and alternative hypothesis now. I'm not even doing anything else, okay? So every time we do a hypothesis test, you know, you're going to hear something about a claim or we want to run a test or whatever, you got to jump straight to null and alternative. And I'll show you that, you know, I'll practice it, right? Um, so that's the first part. P-value. You're going to need, and actually I saw this. I'm going to probably... I'll talk about it again because I'll have to bring this back up. But your first assignment deals with a lot of understanding what things are. And so the first couple of questions from what I see deals with interpreting p-value. And so p-value is a probability, a probability that you will see a test statistic as extreme or more extreme as the one calculated when the null hypothesis is true. And I guess I'll have to come back to that because I'm going to have to refer back to the examples there. I want to at least talk about all these things. Test statistic. Um, test statistic is what we use to basically help with our test, running our test. And this can be calculated with tricks, regardless of what you guys use. It can be formulas, TI-84, Desmos. I don't know what you guys are using, but... I mean, I use TI-84, that's what I'm going to show you. So the p-value and the test statistic can be found with the calculator trick simply, okay? A critical value, though, I think you've heard that term before. You're going to find it again. Remember I told you last week that when you're doing your confidence interval, you can get away without finding the critical value as long as you know your calculator trick. You didn't need to find the critical value for the calculator trick, but I said you still need to know how to find it because you will need to find it later. And this is where I'm talking. You need to know how to find a critical value for a hypothesis test because, you know, your, your calculator trick. Um, and when I talk about your calculator tricks regarding tests, it's not going to give you the critical value. It's only going to give you the test statistic and the P value. So <clears throat> you have to go through another process to get your critical values. And like I said, I'm gonna show you all this stuff. Um, so yeah, and a critical value could be a T value or a Z value again, okay? Just like it was last couple of weeks. Now here's another reason why there are so many pieces to hypothesis testing. You have all these terms that you're gonna see, but you also have three types of tests that can happen. You have a left tail test, a right tail test, or a two tail test. And this is important because it tells you where, you know, these rejection regions are, what we call the rejection regions that correspond to your critical value. So your critical value is found based on your rejection region or your critical region. And that is found deter by determining the type of test that you have, whether it's left, right, or two. And you determine what kind of test it is based on the alternative. So if the alternative points to the left, you have a left tailed test, which means that your rejection region or your critical region is in the left tail. And I have this picture here. And the critical value is the value that separates that from the rest. If your alternative hypothesis points to the right or has a greater than symbol, then your rejection region is in the right tail, sometimes called a critical region also, just in case you hear either. Um, and this is the region in the right tail, and the critical value is the value separating that region from the rest. And again, we're going to use these to help <laughs> to help come to our conclusion about our hypothesis test. But we need to know what kind of test it is. Or you can have a two-tailed test, and you determine you have a two-tailed test if the alternative has a not equal to. Alternative hypothesis is telling you the type of test which means that now I have two rejection regions or two critical regions, and this is the only situation where you have two critical values. So I drew these pictures because you guys can look back on this and CV is critical value and RR is rejection region, which I did, you know, put all my abbreviations here as well. Um, and you'll see my little alpha, 
my little alpha. Alpha is the area of the rejection region. And I'll come back to that when I get to an example too. So, <laughs> so obviously, when you're finding your critical values, since there's horizontal values on either a standard normal distribution curve or student T distribution curve, you find them with either inverse norm or inverse T, dependent on whether you're on, you know, you're doing Z's or, or T's, right? <clears throat> okay. All right, so those are the three type of tests based on my alternative hypothesis again, okay? Conclusion is basically based on your null hypothesis. And, and this is where sometimes people get confused because the way that the way that it's spoken, the verbiage used regarding your conclusion and interpretation can be confusing. And, it, and, and think about it as um, statisticians can't state things definitely, right? Because there's always potential, you know, error. So <laughs> we say either two conclusions, we reject the null hypothesis, or we fail to reject the null. <laughs> um, I might add to this, actually. Let me add to this. Just for your interpretations, I'm going to show you. Just for your notes. So, because you're going to have to pick which interpretation matches your situation. So, again, whenever you have a, a test, you have a claim, you always talk about your null hypothesis. Write these two down first, right? That's going to tell you the kind of test that you have. Um, you have two, two conclusions that you can come to. You're either going to basically reject this, which means throw it away. If I'm rejecting this, I don't like it, then I'm going to say that I support this. If I'm rejecting the null, then I'm supporting the alternative. Typically, when we interpret this, we say, typically, there is sufficient evidence to warrant the claim. And then, hold on, let me see. I think they might use a little other like verbiage for this too, just so you have it for your notes. I wanna make sure I put it down here. Mm -mm -mm -mm. It's not in this, maybe it's next week. Let me see if it's on this third assignment because they keep adding with each, there it is. Um, Level of significance, the data suggests, is not significant, so they're statistically insignificant. <laughs> um, if I'm rejecting the null, supporting the alternative, there is sufficient evidence to warrant the claim that I'm going to say supports the alternative, because the verbiage that we get is going to be based on what the claim was. And then this one, when we are failing to reject the null, which means we can't can't reject it. Why the hell? Why is that not moving? Okay. Um, <laughs> which means that we can't reject it. And then I'm gonna put this here for your notes because I'm not gonna probably not gonna get through everything today either. So we'll say if we fail to reject the null, there is not sufficient evidence to support or warrant, warrant, sometimes they use that word, um, the claim that supports the alternative. Um, so like I said, I, I, this is the part obviously that makes people uncomfortable too, but we're gonna practice it enough. And when we practice it enough, you're gonna see repetition again in the interpretation um, <clears throat> and hopefully, you know, why, you know, it comes, <laughs> where it comes from. I, I typically like copy it from the actual claim. So I'm gonna use this as my, this example here. I'm gonna use this just to kind of show you an, an example of an interpretation and a conclusion, okay? Um, so again, if I reject the null, then I'm supporting the alternative because there's only two to talk about. Or if I fail to reject the null, I can't support the alternative. So again, it's these two things here, right? This one and this one. So if I am rejecting this, then I have to support this. And if I fail to reject this, 
then I cannot support this. And again, I'll probably repeat this so many times <laughs> before the end of the week or within the next two weeks. So in this particular example, we failed to reject the null, which means I could not support the alternative. And so I said there was insufficient evidence to support the claim that patients at rural hospitals have an average waiting time that's different than seven hours. Because I'm not supporting the alternative, which said that it was different. I can't support that the waiting time is different. But I can also say that there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that the rural hospitals do have an average waiting time that is, well, not different than seven hours or basically equal to seven. So in this case, I'm failing to reject this, which is stating that the average is basically equal to seven. So I can't support that it's different than seven, but I can support that it is equal to seven. That's, that's kind of how we're interpreting based on this conclusion. I'll come back to that again, okay? But you'll have these notes, all right? You're gonna have to refer back to them, I'm sure. Now, the other part of hypothesis testing feeling in, intense, not only do you need to know these, these values and these, and I think I have to add a couple to this as well, but you also need to have, know the three tests that are possible the two types of conclusions and the interpretation based on that. But also there's three different methods that we can use to come to the conclusion. And I don't think we use the confidence interval method much here. You may have like heard a little bit about it regarding the assignments from last week, but I don't think we use this much, if at all. OK, so I'm going to exit out for now and focus on the first two, because I think the focus for your assignments, at least for this week, are the first two, okay? First two methods. So we have what's called the traditional method or the critical value method, I think as your book calls it. And <clears throat> in this method, we're comparing the test statistic to the critical value. So I, I do this for a reason because technically the traditional method is basically the same as the p-value method. It's just that one of them is comparing values on the horizontal and one of them is comparing areas. So um, we say if we're using the traditional method, if the test statistic is within the rejection region, rejection region, we call it rejection region for a reason, and that's like critical value region, rejection region, we call it that for a reason. If the test statistic is in the rejection region, then we're rejecting the null. It's in the rejection region. So if we have a test statistic, let's say it's a left tailed test, if we have a test statistic value here that's less than the critical value, then it's in the rejection region and I'm rejecting the null. This is one method. <laughs> if the test statistic, and remember, the test statistic is found with your calculator trick. If the test statistic is in the right tail for a right tailed test or in the rejection region, then it's in that region, you reject your null. And then you have two regions to look at. If the test statistic is in either region, then you can reject. If it's not, then you call, you say, we fail to reject the null. So this is the first method that you can use to come to your conclusion. The second method is called the p-value method. And again, it compares areas. And the p-value is an area and this thing alpha, which is a, also known as a significance level here. So if you ever hear significance level, which you will, alpha is always given to you. P-value you find with your calculator tricks. P-value you'll find, test statistic you'll find, alpha is given. <clears throat> if your P-value is less than or equal to alpha, then you're rejecting the null. If the P-value is greater than alpha, you're failing to reject the null. Um, the P-value is that area like I'm going to show it on here and I'll come back to I'll probably repeat this again, but um, let's say my test statistic is here. I calculate it with my calculator. My test that test statistic is over here. Let's say to the left of this critical value in the left tailed test. And I have an area to the left of that and that area is the p value. OK, so the area that we get when we know a test statistic is called a p value. If the p-value is smaller than alpha, which you see that the alpha is your rejection region with your critical value, if this p-value is smaller than alpha, then you can say that the test statistic is in the rejection region and you're rejecting your null. 
I'm going to re repeat that again. But I said that both of these methods are basically doing the same thing. It's just that one is looking at areas and one is not. So the, the p-value method is used a lot. If you ever look at medical um, papers and they use hypothesis testing, they talk about p-values a lot. Um, the p-value method is probably the quickest, fastest way to come to a conclusion, especially if you're using different tricks like your calculator or, or um, whatever, Excel. P-value is easy to find and easy to compare to alpha. So it's used most often, but I know some students that I've had in the past prefer the traditional method because they, they look at it as more of a visual type of way to come to your conclusion because it's very easy to say, well, the test statistic is here. Here's the rejection region. It's in there. I'm rejecting. Um, whereas if the test statistic, let's just look at, let's look at this one. Let's just assume it's a right tail test here. If the test statistic was here um, on a right tail test, it's not in the rejection region, then I would fail to reject. It's not there. I can't reject the null. In this particular example here, because it's a right tail test and the test statistic is all the way there, the p-value would be the area corresponding to the test statistic. And, I, and the p-value method says that if the p-value is bigger than alpha, which in this particular case it is, because it has more area than this little rejection region, which is our alpha, um, then we fail to reject the null. Same thing as if the test statistic is not within the rejection region, we fail to reject the null. <clears throat> so they're both saying the same thing. One is saying this value here, let's call it if it's a z-score, this value here is not you know, to the right or bigger than this value. So it's not in this region. And so I can't reject it. But also because the p-value is the area corresponding to that, then this area, this green area is bigger than this black area. So the p-value is bigger than the alpha. And so it's, so in other words, that's saying the same thing as the test statistic not being in the rejection region, so I can't reject. Versus if I look at this one, the test statistic is to the left of the critical value, if it's a left-tailed test, which means it's in the rejection region, so I would reject the null. And then because the p-value is the area to the left of that on the left-tailed test, it's obvious that the, the area, the red area, is smaller than the black area for this example, which the black area is my alpha. And so the p-value being smaller, that area being smaller, so the red area being smaller than the black area is basically telling that the test statistic is in the rejection region, so I'm rejecting the null. So, I mean, I show you this only because I want you to see that these two methods are basically the same thing. One of them is comparing these two values, and one of them is comparing these two. These are both areas. These are both either z-scores or t-scores dependent. These are both areas. These are both either T scores or Z scores, dependent on, you know, but these are being compared, <coughs> excuse me, for the traditional method. And these are being compared for the p value method. Yet at the same time, it's really the same thing. So I hope that makes sense. Even if you have to repeat this later, rewind this. I hope it makes sense after you do some examples. So you can either, you, you can use either method, but being that obviously we, you know, you're going to be asked about each method. So sometimes, you're going to be asked to find a critical value and then it's going to be like, well, since the critical value is less uh, or since the test statistic is less than the critical value, then we're rejecting and they're going to have you put a lot. Of, <laughs> there's a lot of drop downs. There's a lot of um, answer inputs here. It's, it's going to look like a lot, but I'm going to every time I do a problem, I'll probably get all the values and I'll probably talk about every single method. Um, to run the test, just to refer back to both, but you could be asked for any particular value or any particular method, and based on that method, what your conclusion is. So you do have to know both. Some people do prefer one to the other, so when you're not asked to use a method, you could use whatever you want, or use the method you're asked, and then use the method you like to verify, whatever. Every example I'm going to do, I'm probably going to use both methods and just find the same stuff every time, just so you see it every time. And there's repetition. Um, these are my calculator tricks, which I'll come back to when we get to an example. I think I'll be able to do an example tonight. Let me bring that to the top. And then I really don't know why like your first assignment talks a lot about type one and type two errors, because to me, you need to go through a hypothesis test and understand that before you even get to the errors that are possible to understand, especially the verbiage, you know, required for this. 
So I'll probably talk about these errors every example too, but you have this for your notes. You have two errors that are possible. And being that there are two conclusions, there are two errors, and this is not, you know, a one and this is like, it's not an L, this is Roman numeral, it's supposed to be Roman numeral one and two. Um, that's how we represent these, so I'll just stick like that, okay? It's not an I, it's Roman numerals. So we have a type one error, type two error, two errors, because there's two conclusions, and the type one error is rejecting a null when it is true. Well, if you're rejecting something, then you're supporting the alternative. Again, you're supporting the alternative because you're rejecting the null. When it, you're rejecting the null when it's true, you're supporting the alternative when you shouldn't. In other words, and when I get to my conclusions, I'll come back to this again. I'm probably going to leave these notes up and just keep referring back to them, okay? A type 2 error is failing to reject the null, which means not supporting the alternative. When you, when you should support it, when it is true, I'll say, and you should. So, you got, you have a lot of interpretation on your first assignment. Um, and a few of them are interpreting significance level. A few of them are interpreting, a lot of them is talking about the type one and type two error. And whenever you're doing your type one and type two error, I always like to have my null and alternative hypothesis in front of me and the conclusion. So again, and actually, um, good. This one showed you examples interpreting type one and type two errors. That this last one that I put in here. <clears throat> so anytime I'm interpreting a type one and a type two error, I have my null and my alternative hypothesis in front of me. And I have um, you know, my conclusion based on that. And then what a type one or type two uh, hypothesis, a uh, type one or type two error is, and then I and then I interpret it. This is just me organizing everything in front of me. So like this, for example, the claim was that the average wait time in the ER is greater than six hours. So this is also going to practice finding your null and your alternative hypothesis, right? I hear greater than, so there should be a greater than symbol, and the greater than symbol always goes on the alternative. We're running a claim about an average, so mu, and so the claim is that the average wait time is greater than six hours. The um, null hypothesis always has an equal to, or I think sometimes just with your book, oops, I got a lot of stuff up, oops, okay. Um, sometimes with your book, okay, Whoa. oh, sometimes with your book, you might see less than or equal to. Um, but always the equal to on the null. So your conclusion, we ran a test, whatever, and we concluded that we rejected the null from whatever, you know, method. Okay. So, oops. So much crap up. Where'd it go? This, okay. Um, so our conclusion was rejecting the null. And so we say, since we're rejecting the null, we're supporting the alternative. There is sufficient evidence to support the claim, the alternative, that the average wait time is greater than six, right? I'm rejecting this, so I'm supporting what this says. And, and I told you guys from, from jump, like you really wanna understand what the variables mean. You wanna understand what they mean. Like, what does this symbol mean? It's a population mean, a population average. What does it mean here? The population average, however the, the population is defined. Average wait time in the ER. Okay, you want to be able to convert the symbols back into words. That's very important with hypothesis testing. So I'm rejecting this, so I'm supporting that the average is greater than six. 
in this case, average wait time. So I hope that makes sense. That's my conclusion and my interpretation based on whatever. Now, because I rejected the null, and that's a type one error, rejecting the null, when it is true, that's the error. I have a possible type one error here. I rejected the null, but it might be true. How do I interpret that type one error if I made it? So if I'm rejecting the null, then I'm supporting the alternative, supporting the claim that the average wait time is greater than six. I'm supporting that when I shouldn't, when it is not greater than six hours, right? I'm rejecting this when I shouldn't reject this. So I'm supporting this when I shouldn't support this. I'm supporting the claim that the average wait time is bigger than six when it's not. So that's an example of a type one error. Type two error. Same claim, same, you know, null and alternative hypothesis, but let's say the conclusion was to fail to reject the null. So now I changed my conclusion, right? How do I interpret that type um, error, in this case, type two error, because I'm failing to reject the null. Um, so I can't reject this, which means I can't support this. So there's not, there's not sufficient evidence to support the claim that the average wait time in the ER is greater than six. I can't support this because I can't reject this. Can't support this because I can't reject this. So I'm failing to reject the null, but I could be making a mistake. Right? I'm failing to reject this when this is not true. Or I'm not supporting this when I should be. Not supporting the claim that the average wait time in the ER is greater than six when it is greater than six. So obviously, this is going to take practice. You're going to have to go over this stuff over and over again, but just like confidence intervals, um, <clears throat> you're going to have to. I would say go beyond what the question asks because it might just ask you for one thing. Um, go beyond what the question asks you. So practice, not the calculator trick, no. Practice all the pieces for every single problem. So I want to show you an example. Just to start, can I use this? All right, wait, let me stop recording for a second. <clears throat> 